6.2, the binomial probability distribution. Let's take a look at some criteria for a binomial probability experiment. In order to be a binomial experiment, it must be performed a fixed number of times, and each repetition is called a trial. The trials must be independent, meaning that the outcome of one trial will not affect the outcome of another trial. For each trial, there are two mutually exclusive outcomes, success or failure. The probability of success is fixed for each trial of the experiment. Now let's take a look at some notation that we're going to be using. N is the number of trials, independent trials of the experiment. P is the probability of success. And remember that our probabilities have to add up to one so the probability of failure is 1 minus p. Keep in mind these are called binomial probability distributions because there are only two outcomes, success or failure. Bi means two, so binomial means that there are two outcomes. Let x be a binomial random variable that denotes the number of successes in n independent trials of the experiment. All right, so let's take a look and see if we can identify some binomial experiments. A player rolls a pair of fair, and that should say dice, 10 times. The number x of sevens rolled is recorded. So let's take a look at those criteria again. Is our experiment being performed a fixed number of times? Yes, it's being performed 10 times. Are the trials independent? If I roll a pair and I get a 7 the first time, is that going to affect whether or not I get a 7 the second time? No. So they are independent. Are they mutually exclusive? Is there, is there a defined difference between success and failure? Yes. If I get a 7, that's success. If I don't get a 7, that's failure. And they can't both happen at the same time. And the probability of success is the same for each trial. So this one is a binomial experiment. All right, the 11 largest airlines had an on-time percentage of 84.7% in November 2001, according to the Air Travel Consumer Report. In order to assess reasons for delays, an official with the FAA randomly selects flights until she finds 10 that were not on time. The number of flights X that needed to be selected is recorded. Now, was this experiment performed a fixed number of times? No. So this is not a binomial experiment. In a class of 30 students, 55% are female. The instructor randomly selects four students. The number X of females selected is recorded. Our trials in this case are not independent, so this is not a binomial experiment. All right, let's take a look at the probability distribution function. Now, the probability of obtaining x successes, remember x we usually represent for the successes, um, and then n is the number of trials, is this formula using combinations that we learned in our probability chapter. So the probability of x, remember that's the number of successes, is equal to n, which is the number of trials, combination x, so you can type that in your calculator, times the probability of success to the power of how many successes you got, times the quantity of 1 minus that probability to the power of the number of failures, basically, um, that you got. And you would do this for all your x values from 0 all the way up to n. Now remember that p is the probability of success. And you're going to want to remember some of these mathematical symbols. Um, going down the right-hand side, you have at least no less than or greater than or equal to. Remember that the part where they come together, the smaller end, um, is where the smaller value is going to be and the part where the two lines are spread apart is where the greater value is going to be. And then that equal just, the line underneath just means equal to. 
So the next one down is more than or greater than. The next one is fewer than or less than. The fourth one down is no more than, at most, or less than or equal to. And then, of course, the last one is exactly equals or is. All right. So according to the Experian Automotive, 35% of all car owning households have three or more cars. And we're gonna use this example a lot throughout this lesson. In a random sample of 20 car owning households, what is the probability that exactly five have three or more cars? So we wanna find P of five. So we use our formula where N is 20, P is five, I'm sorry, X is five, P is 0.35, and we come up with 0.1272. So there's about a 12.72% chance that exactly five of those 20 will have three or more cars. All right, now in this case, we wanna find out what the probability is that less than four have three or more cars, less than four. So that means it doesn't include the four. So X is less than four, which is really the same thing in this case because it's a discrete random variable, is X is less than or equal to three. So we're gonna look at the probability of zero, plus the probability of one, plus the probability of two, plus the probability of three. So we're gonna use that formula for each of those X values, and then we're gonna add them all up, and we get the point zero four four four. Now in class, we'll talk about how we can easily plug that into the calculator to be able to solve for the problem. Now let's take a look at what the probability is that at least four of the households have three or more cars, at least four. So that means it can be four, but then it can also be greater than four. Okay, so X is greater than or equal to four, which is really the same thing as one minus P of X is less than or equal to three, which we already found. Because on the left-hand side, those are looking at all the values, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to 20. And then when you look at the right-hand side, it's one minus the probability of the values of one, zero, one, two, and three. So if we just take the value that we just found in the previous example and subtract that from one, we get our probability. So 0.9556 is the probability that at least four have three or more cars. All right, let's take a look at the mean and the standard deviation for these binomial probability distributions. Remember that N is the number of independent trials and P is the probability of success. So our mean formula is just the number of trials times the probability of success. And your standard deviation is the square root of, and then you multiply N times P times one minus P and then take the square root of that. So let's take a look at this example. In a simple random sample of 400 car owning households, determine the mean and standard deviation number of car owning households that will have three or more cars. So all we're doing is taking the number, which was 400 of trials, and the probability of success, which was 35%, and we're multiplying them to get the mean. So we get 140. So the mean number of car owning households that have three or more cars is 140 households. And then the standard deviation is gonna be 9.54 um, households. So um, we can take that information and use it. So now we're gonna look at binomial probability distributions. Okay, we're gonna take a look at three different binomial distributions. We're gonna make histograms out of them where our number of trials is eight for every, in every case. Um, but the probability of the first one of getting success is 15%. The second one, the probability of success is 50%. And the third one is an 85% probability of success. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at these and compare them. And then we're gonna comment on the shape of each of the distributions. Now remember, we need to use that formula for our P of X. Remember that P of X equals N combination X times P to the power of X times one minus P times the power of N minus X. So we're gonna use that formula to find each of the values um, for the probabilities of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight for each of these. The only difference is the probability of success. Okay, so remember that formula and we're gonna, com we're gonna compute that formula for each value from zero to eight. 
All right, so in the first one where our probability of success was very small, it was 0.15, our histogram is skewed to the right because the more trials you have, the less likely it is that you're going to have successes. Notice that when it's a 50% chance of success, we have a symmetric histogram, a symmetric distribution. And then when we had an 85% chance of success, we're very skewed to the left because the smaller number of trials doesn't allow for that probability of success. The more trials you have, the more successful it is. Okay. Now, for a fixed probability of success P, as the number of trials increases, then their distribution is going to become more and more bell-shaped. And you can use this general rule of thumb where that expression that was under the radical for our standard deviation equation, NP times 1 minus P, if that's greater than 10, then the probability dis distribution will be approximately bell-shaped. And that's going to be important later. All right, so we take a look at um, this binomial histogram where we had five, 25 trials and our probability of success was 80%. So you can see it's a little skewed to the left, but when we increase our number of trials to 50, probability of success stays the same, we're getting closer to that normal curve or that um, symmetric shape. And then when we increase our number of trials to 70 with the same probability of success, we're getting even closer and closer to that symmetric shape. So again, as the number of trials increases, the, the probability of distribution will become more and more bell-shaped. All right, we can use the empirical rule to identify unusual observations because, like we just talked about, we have that bell-shaped curve. And so it is symmetric, so we can use that empirical rule. Remember that 95% of observations lie between two standard deviations away from the mean. And remember that we were using 5% as kind of our rule of, thumb, <clears throat> rule of thumb to determine whether something was unusual. So any observation that lies outside this interval can be considered unusual because it occurs less than 5% of the time. All right, let's take a look at an example. Again, we still have that 35% of all car owning households have three or more cars. So now a researcher believes this percentage is higher than the percentage reported by Experian Automotive. He conducts a simple random sample of 400 car owning households and found that 162 had three or more cars. Is this result unusual? Well, again, remember that to find our mean, we take the number of trials, in this case it's 400, times the probability of success, which is 0.35. So we have 140 households is our mean. And then our standard deviation, we find that um, our standard deviation is 9.54 households. All right, so remember our mean and our standard deviation. So now let's take a look at two standard deviations to the left of the mean. So we're going to subtract two standard deviations and we get 120.9. Then we're going to add two standard deviations to the mean and we get 159.1. So let's compare those values to the number of households that he found um, had three or more cars. And his number was 162, which is outside of that interval. So it is considered unusual because it's part of that 5%. So this would happen less than 5% of the time.